Welcome back, everyone. In the last video, we followed the incredible journey of George Gamow and explored the fundamental concepts that shape our understanding of the universe. Now, let's continue this adventure, diving even deeper into the mysteries of the Big Bang and the formation of the first atoms. Light can transform into something else, matter. Light is a form of energy, and energy and matter are two sides of the same cosmic coin. They are completely interchangeable, and the more energetic the light, the higher the likelihood it will transform into matter. Within a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, part of the universe's energy converted into particles of matter that began to emerge, flooding the universe with fundamental particles, everything needed to build atoms, including electrons, However, we still have to wait hundreds of thousands of years for these particles to actually come together to form the first atom. We already have electrons, but to make a hydrogen atom, like the one explored by our travelers, we also need a proton. Unlike electrons, protons are made of something else. Quarks, fundamental particles that also appeared during the partial metamorphosis of light into matter. Quarks come in different flavors, but the most important ones for our story of atom formation are the up quark and the down quark. Up quarks have a positive charge and down quarks have a negative charge. A proton is made up of two up quarks and one down quark, giving the proton an overall positive charge. But these quarks are not natural companions. Electric charges act like the poles of a magnet. Opposites attract, but like charges repel. How do two positively charged quarks manage to stay side by side inside a proton? The solution to this puzzle lies in the forces, the glue necessary to unite the first atom. Physicists know four fundamental forces in the universe. Two are familiar to us, gravity and electromagnetism. Light is an electromagnetic wave, and it is electromagnetism that repels quarks with like charges. In the atomic world, two less familiar forces come into play. The weak nuclear force governs radioactivity, but it is the strong nuclear force that truly dominates here. It is a duodecillion times stronger than gravity. That's 10 followed by 38 zeros, significantly more zeros than there are stars in the observable universe. The strong nuclear force is also 100 times stronger than the electromagnetic force. So, Two quarks with the same charge may want to repel each other, but the strong nuclear force can counteract this electromagnetic instinct and keep them together. However, there is a catch. The strong nuclear force may be the queen of forces, but the realm it governs is minuscule. It only has dominion over the tiniest distances, about a trillionth of a millimeter. Initially, the energies are too high for quarks to bond through the strong force. When quarks formed, the temperature of the universe was over a quadrillion degrees Fahrenheit. Although they pass very close to each other, quarks collide with such high energy that they cannot unite. But the new universe is always expanding. It cools as it grows, and the particles within it slow down. After the first millionth of a second, the temperature drops to mere trillions of degrees, and the first protons manage to form. Neutrons also form, the other type of particle you'll find in an atomic nucleus. They are made of one up quark and two down quarks. Seems simple, right? But again, like Bohr's model of the atom, neutrons and protons are not so straightforward. For one thing, the three quarks together, known as valence quarks, make up only 1% of the mass of the proton. The rest is occupied by particles called gluons, these are the particles that carry the strong nuclear force. It is by exchanging gluons that the trio of valence quarks manages to unite into a proton. But it gets even stranger. Occasionally, the gluons accumulate enough energy to transform into a quark and its antimatter equivalent, the antiquark. These so-called C quarks quickly recombine back into a gluon. So, at any given moment, a proton is actually a blur of valence quarks, gluons, and C quarks. We do not yet understand all the details, and experiments like the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider in New York are helping physicists investigate more deeply inside the proton. 
What we do know is that gluons and C quarks make up 99% of the proton's mass. Since they are not permanent, physicists refer to C quarks as virtual particles. This means that the mass of the proton, the particle you'll find at the center of every atom in the universe, comes mainly from a myriad of C quarks that actually do not exist. From the top quark to the bottom, from strange to charm, a full range of quarks can be found as C quarks, appearing and disappearing for periods so short they do not violate energy conservation. A recent experiment at the University of Milan even showed that sometimes charm quarks appear at lower energies. And the most bizarre, charm quarks have nearly one and a half times the mass of the entire proton. The low probability of this happening means their total mass is not added to the proton itself. The quantum world of the very small is a counterintuitive place. Returning to the universe's timeline, now that we have protons and neutrons, the next stop in our journey to the first atom comes as the universe continues to cool and expand, causing the protons and neutrons to slow down. In 1948, George Gamow published a letter in the scientific journal Physical Review Letters. The paper suggests that within a few minutes after the Big Bang, the universe cooled to a billion degrees, enough to allow the strong nuclear force to unite a proton and a neutron. This proton-neutron pair is known as deuteron and is the gateway to a new way of building structures in the infant universe. Stars like the Sun generate vast amounts of light by transforming hydrogen into helium through a process called nuclear fusion. A little less helium comes out than the amount of hydrogen that goes in, and the difference is converted into sunlight as mass transforms back into energy. Along with Ralph Alpher, Gamow was the first to discover the series of steps by which fusion transforms hydrogen into helium, and deuterons played a crucial role, because when a deuteron combines with a proton, it forms the nucleus of a helium-3 atom. Then, when two helium-3 nuclei fuse, they form the nucleus of a helium-4 atom and two extra neutrons. In the modern universe, these reactions can only occur in places with extreme temperatures and pressures, such as the cores of stars. But similar temperatures were present throughout the universe shortly after the Big Bang, although not for long. There was only an incredibly short window for fusion to occur. The temperature had to be cool enough for deuterons to form, but still hot enough to fuse everything else. And this window opened less than a second after the Big Bang and closed about 20 minutes later when the universe cooled. A period of about 20 minutes in which about a quarter of the universe's mass of hydrogen nuclei transformed into helium nuclei. And so we have a universe that is still only 20 minutes old, sprinkled with 12 hydrogen nuclei for every helium nucleus and a billion light particles for every nucleus. Incredible progress in just over a quarter of an hour. But we still do not have the first atom. For that, we need to bind electrons in orbit around these nuclei. And that would take a long time. Electrons are negatively charged, and protons make atomic nuclei positively charged. Opposites attract, so the electromagnetic force can capture a passing electron and trap it in orbit around the nucleus. But the electromagnetic force is a hundred times weaker than the strong nuclear force. So the universe needs to cool to just 4,000 degrees for the particles to slow down enough for the electromagnetic force to do its job. This will take 380,000 years of expansion after the Big Bang for the universe to reach this point. Then finally, the first atom forms. But, like the bizarre components of its nucleus, adding electrons certainly does not make things any less complicated. Electrons were discovered in the late 19th century, but time has only increased their enigma. With almost 2,000 times less mass than a proton, an electron is generally considered a single point with no shape or internal structure truly fundamental, like quarks. They do not orbit the nucleus like planets around the sun. Quantum physics tells us it is impossible to know both the position and velocity of an electron precisely at the same time. At any given moment, an electron is not in one point around the nucleus. It occupies all possible points simultaneously. 
A single electron envelops the nucleus like a mist, and we can only speak about where it is likely to be. Electrons, like all other fundamental particles, also have a curious property called spin. They are deflected by magnetic fields as if they were spinning charged balls. This rotation is counterintuitive. If you rotate 360 degrees, in other words, spin a full circle, then you return to the starting point. You are a spin one entity. But electrons are spin one two entities. They need to rotate 720 degrees to return to the starting point. Except electrons are not actually spinning. Quantum physics prohibits that. While it is useful to think of them as spinning, they cannot. And so, everywhere we look, the inside of an atom is like a vast hall of mirrors. Deception, illusion, and subterfuge accompany each of our attempts to understand it. A bizarre quantum realm that defies common sense, shrouded in mysteries we are far from unraveling. But what we know is that the formation of the first atoms, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, freed the light. Light photons now have a path to escape the previously impenetrable labyrinth they had created for themselves. With electrons suddenly sucked into orbits around atomic nuclei, there is a sudden increase in space between matter. Light can travel without hitting anything, and there it goes at 299,792,458 meters per second, or 186,282 miles per second. In 1948, Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman based their work on this and predicted that this first light flooding the universe, hundreds of millennia after the Big Bang, should still be visible today. And finding it would be the equivalent of irrefutable proof that the universe really began with a hot Big Bang. Unfortunately, no one paid much attention, and the idea was largely forgotten for a decade and a half. In September 1941, World War II is in full swing, and the United States has not yet entered the war, but is preparing for it. Robert Dick, a 25-year-old prodigy who has just completed his doctorate, arrives at MIT. Little did he know that, in a few weeks, the attack on Pearl Harbor would change everything, and the U.S. would enter the war the next day. Dick is a born inventor, with incredible electronic skills. He inherited this from his father, who was a patent attorney. During his life, Dickey registered over 50 patents, from clothes dryers to lasers. At MIT, his focus was radar. Did you know that the word radar comes from radio detection and ranging? That's right. It was coined by the US Navy a year earlier. The radars of that time were not very accurate. They used radio waves, which are a type of light with the longest wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. But Dickey was working on something revolutionary, using microwaves instead of radio waves. Microwaves have a shorter wavelength, which means they can provide much more detailed images. Dickey invented a new receiver to capture these reflected microwaves, known as the Dickey radiometer. And this is where the young scientist's curiosity comes into play. He began to wonder if there would be microwaves coming from the cosmos. So there he is, on the roof of the MIT Radiation Laboratory, pointing his radiometer at the sky. This idea would follow him for over a decade until he arrived at Princeton, where he made one of the most important discoveries in 20th century cosmology. Dickey began exploring the idea of cyclic universes, a universe that expands, slows down, stops and shrinks, collapsing in on itself in a big crunch, only to explode again in another big bang. A collapsing universe would become extremely hot, stripping electrons from protons and creating a sea of subatomic particles. Dickey called it the fireball. The subsequent expansion would cool this fireball, allowing atoms to reform, hence the term recombination. Thinking about this scenario, Dicka realized that there should be residual radiation from this super hot phase, still visible today. He called it fireball radiation, it would be the same radiation predicted by Gamow and his colleagues in 1948, although Dickey was initially unaware of their work. Dickey calculated that this fireball radiation would now be in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum, exactly the part he had spent two decades working on. So, he decided to look for it with his radiometer 
and began planning an observation for the mid-1960s. But something strange happened before he could complete his work. About a 45-minute drive away in Holmdel, New Jersey, two radio astronomers were trying a different experiment. Their names were Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. They were using the giant Holmdel horn antenna, part of Bell Telephone Laboratories, to listen to radio waves reflected by satellites in orbit. But there was a problem, a persistent noise that seemed to come from all over the sky. After eliminating all possible sources of interference, including pigeons nesting in the antenna, the noise persisted. Desperate, Penzias called Dickey in Princeton. Dickey was in a meeting about his search for the fireball radiation. When he heard what Penzias had to say, he realized, well guys, we've been scooped. Penzias and Wilson went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1978, while Dickey was left empty-handed. But what this story shows us is the beauty of science and human curiosity. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation is the indisputable proof that our universe began with a Big Bang. And so, we conclude our journey through the history of the universe and atoms, from the Big Bang to the fundamental discovery of the cosmic background radiation. I hope you enjoyed this fascinating journey through the cosmos and quantum physics. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more interesting content about the universe. Until next time.